before now that he has also many years uh, in uh, the famous IBM He has received uh, numerous awards. Now, some of them actually are pretty big titles. Vice President of the Indian Translation or Research Scholar. And also uh, IBM Invention Achievement Award, That's something I really want. Um, <laughs> and there are a few for things they ask. Oh, that's the uh, company that set up uh, the data warehouse for Walmart. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, Research Scholar Invention Award, excellent performance. As you can see from this kind of award title, it's not surprising, but it's still surprising to me. So the so the law has a twenty five items, <laughs> some kind of uh, you know, issues for him, and he is always the first one, first inventor. That's not really amazing. And the related to that is also can it's also very uh, productive. He has published more than fifty papers and uh, also he his research is very well supported, it's, uh, including both from the academic field and from industry. Uh, lastly, Dr. Kang's uh, research is mainly in uh, machine learning, computational biology, working on with uh, clinical data, especially about uh, this is kind of you know, the, the patient, you know, the, you know, the outcome of the safety and some other issues. So you will see from the title of this talk. So please welcome to uh, the join to welcome Dr. Kang's uh, talk. Uh, okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, I have many personal connections with uh, Houston. Um, my previous roommate was a lawyer here for a few years, and uh, the two lawyers who filed patents with me in the past so many years, they all live here, although I never physically come to Houston. In the past, they just fly to, for example, Wisconsin and meet with me. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, automating machine learning uh, model building with big clinical data. So let me first give some background on predictive modeling on big clinical data. In this talk, we use big clinical data to refer to large clinical data sets. So as you know, uh, you all know, the volume of healthcare data is rapidly increasing by 50-fold in eight years to so many petabytes by year 2020. And those data come from different sources, such as electronic medical records, uh, sensors, and mobile devices and they provide a lot of opportunities for us to advance clinical research and biomedical uh, uh, research. Predictive modeling is a method that uses those large heterogeneous data sets to advance knowledge and force discovery, and they can help appropriate and timely care. So I'll give you a few examples here, but there are many more examples. So let's say we focus on asthma patients. Some asthma patients will have bad outcomes in the future. So if we can predict which asthma patients will have bad outcomes in the future, we can put them into case management program. So we have a dedicated case manager, give them preventative interventions, and closely monitor them. This will reduce their risk and produce better outcome. As a second example, um, let's consider uh, bronchitis. Bronchitis is a disease that's mainly in children under age two, and it's the most common disease that leads to hospitalization in this uh, age group. So many bronchitis patients will come to the emergency room, and in this case, the emergency room doctors need to help to figure out who should be admitted into the hospital and who should be discharged home. So if you make the wrong decision, you have worse outcomes. So in this case, you want to build a model to guide the clinicians to make the right, appropriate admission decisions. As a third example, it's still about bronchitis. So children with clinically significant bronchitis, this means that those children go to the hospital for bronch uh, bronchitis, or they go to the emergency room for bronchitis, or they go to see their family doctors for bronchitis. So compared to children without bronchitis, children with clinically significant bronchitis are much more likely to develop asthma later in their life. So if we can predict which children will develop asthma in the future, then we can schedule more frequent doctor visits for them so that we can keep monitoring them and diagnose asthma in time. This will help give them asthma treatments in time to reduce the likelihood that they will have bad outcomes in the future. For example, this will reduce the likelihood of getting into the emergency room emergency room for asthma. 
So there are different ways to do 3D modeling. One way is called a statistical uh, 3D modeling. So you can use statistical methods such as logistic regression. All of you should have known this before. And the other method is machine learning, which is a part of computer science. Machine learning uses computer algorithms that improve automatic through experience. And this improvement process is called a model training. There are several dozens of machine learning algorithms that are commonly used, such as support vector machine neural network, decision tree, random forest, etc. And there are certain advantages of machine learning. Sometimes, although not always, machine learning can achieve higher prediction accuracy than other methods, such as logistic regression. And in some infrequent cases, uh, machine learning can even double the prediction accuracy. And the reason machine learning has this advantage is that uh, it poses less strict assumptions on data distribution. However, machine learning has some shortcomings that make its use in healthcare very challenging. So we will go through those challenges in detail later in the talk. But at high level, in order to do machine learning, people need to do many labor-intensive manual iterations. And they need a special machine learning expertise. Basically, we prefer people to be a machine learning master or machine learning PhD uh, to select among complex machine learning algorithms. And for each machine learning algorithm, they need to manually set the values of so-called hyperparameters. We will explain later what this means. And the second, uh, most machine learning models, they're complex. They don't tell you why the prediction results are made in that way. And for learning healthcare system, explanation is critical. So my contribution uh, that's going to be mentioned in this talk is to identify and clarify two challenges faced by healthcare researchers when they try to build machine learning models on big clinical data. There are many uh, challenges in this process. We only describe two here due to time constraints. And we also give you some solutions about how to address those two challenges. So here is the first challenge. Each machine learning algorithm has two types of parameters. One is called ordinary parameters. Those parameters are automatically optimized or learned in a model training phase. The other type of parameter is called a hyperparameter. Those hyperparameters are manually set by the users of machine learning software before we can train the machine learning model. So here are some examples. Neural network is a widely known uh, machine learning algorithm. Neural network has multiple hidden layers on each hidden layer, there are a bunch of nodes. And uh, the nodes are connected by edges. The weight on each edge is an ordinary parameter. The machine learning training algorithm can automatically tune it during the model training process. But before you can train the neural network model, you have to manually select the number of hidden layers. You also need to manually specify the number of nodes on each hidden layer. So those two are hyperparameters. As another example, many of you have heard of random forest, which is a bunch of decision trees voting together. So the number of decision trees is a hyperparameter. You manually set it before you train the model. Each decision tree has a bunch of uh, internal nodes. And on each internal node, there is an input variable used called a feature and also a threshold value. So for example, if the feature is the person's weight, then you can say, is the weight above or below a certain threshold? So which feature is used and what's the threshold value that's being used? Those are ordinary parameters that the model training process can learn by itself. So this is the traditional way of doing machine learning. So if I'm the user, I have a long list of machine learning algorithms, for example, 39 of them in the Weka software. So from this long list of machine learning algorithms, I manually select one of them. Then this machine learning algorithm has a bunch of hyperparameters, typically say two to 10 of them. For each hyperparameter, I need to manually specify a value. And then 
I can ask the software, I say, I click the submit button, uh, you will automatically train the machine learning model for me. So in this case, the software will automatically optimize the ordinary parameters of the chosen algorithm. And uh, typically, at the starting um, iterations, I will get a low prediction accuracy. That's unsatisfactory. So I will manually reset the values of the hyperparameters or I will manually change the machine learning algorithm. Then I will restart the whole process, ask the software to retrain the model, get another prediction accuracy. And in this case, the prediction accuracy is most likely still going to be low. So I try this typically hundreds or thousands of times. And then I will get a prediction accuracy, hopefully high enough. Then I will stop here. That's a typical process. And uh, the impact is huge. So which machine learning algorithm you use and which values you set for the hyperparameters. So let's say you have a good combination versus a bad combination. The difference between them in terms of the effect on the prediction accuracy is over 40%. That means one bad combination will give uh, accuracy like 40%, uh, the other good combination will give you 80%. That's huge. And also, in practice, which machine learning algorithm is good and which values are good for those hyperparameters really depends on what kind of predictive modeling problem you are working on, such as which disease you are working on, what's the predict uh, prediction target, and also depends on your data set. There's no uniform combination that's the best for all problems and all data sets. So that basically means each time you work with a predictive modeling problem, you have to start this process hundreds or thousands of times. OK, so we have mentioned the traditional approach. In order to find a good machine learning algorithm and a good hyperparameter values, we have to go through a long iterative manual process. And for users with limited computing expertise, this is typically beyond their capability. And even for machine learning PhDs, this is a very non-trivial task, takes a long time. So to address this problem, uh, computer science researchers have developed several dozens of automatic methods for automatically selecting the machine learning algorithms and hyperparameter values. And those softwares are mainly developed for people with little computing expertise to do machine learning, but they also turn out to be helpful for machine learning PhDs. It has been shown that often those methods can outperform machine learning PhDs in terms of achieving the best prediction accuracy you can ever do. However, although there are several dozens of methods that have been proposed for this purpose, none of them can efficiently handle big clinical data. So I will give you some concrete examples. Let's say we have a data set that has several thousand rows of patients. Each patient, I have several dozens of attributes, of features. An attribute can be, uh, for example, a patient diagnosis code or a lab test result, etc., or weight. Then, if you want to do automatic selection on this data set, the search process, even if it's done by computer, it can take several days. And I will give you a concrete example later, tell you how slow this is. And uh, in practice, the search time can be up to thousands of times longer for multiple reasons. First, uh, machine learning is an iterative process. If I'm an analyst, I can start from a set of clinical parameters. I can try my best to build the machine learning model, the best one I can find. And this model is likely to give you low prediction accuracy. And in this case, I will think, oh, what about the other clinical attributes that they are available, for example, from the EMR, but they haven't been used in this case, and maybe they are predictive. So I will add some of those clinical attributes into the data set and restart the whole process to rebuild a model. And each of those iterations will require a new 
completely new search for machine learning algorithm and hyperparameter values. And also, I may get a data set from, for example, multiple healthcare systems. So I may have millions of patients. For each patient, I can have many attributes. For example, um, if you use genomic data or textual data, such as uh, 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 the clinical nodes, I can extract many attributes from the genomic data or textual data. So each patient can go through, instead of a few hundred attributes, I can have tens of thousands of attributes. And it's known that uh, the execution time of a machine learning algorithm grows super linearly with the number of rows of patients, like this, and it grows at least, at least linearly with the number of attributes. So that basically means in practice, for a single data set, the search time will be very slow. And if you say, oh, uh, this is not a problem for a single machine learning problem, that's still fine for me. OK, what about a personalized medicine or precision medicine? In this case, uh, you want to consider multiple diseases, such as a few dozen diseases. For each disease, you have several outcomes you are interested in. And for each disease outcome combination, you may want to build a predictive model. So you can easily end up with thousands of predictive modeling problems you want to solve. And this is already the case in the Veteran Affairs Hospital. So in this case, even if the search time is not a problem for a single predictive modeling problem, it will become a problem in this particular case. So what I try to convince you is showing that in order to use big clinical data, we need automatic methods that can select machine learning algorithms and hyperparameter values. Those methods need to appeal to healthcare researchers in the sense that they need to be completely automatic. No human need to be involved in the search process. And second, they can efficiently handle large clinical data sets. OK, now let's uh, move on to the second challenge. We can build the machine learning model as accurate as possible. But if we just give the model to clinicians, they are still unhappy because there's no explanation given to the clinicians. So the clinicians do not trust the prediction results. And also, if the clinicians can know the reason, for example, why a patient is likely to have bad outcome, then they can use the reason to determine appropriate interventions to tailored to that particular reason. Let's say if we know, oh, uh, asthma patient is going to have bad outcome because this patient lives far away from the physician, so he has difficulty assessing care. Then in this case, based on this reason, we can say, oh, the intervention should be we provide free transportation for this patient so that he can go to see the doctor more frequently, and this will reduce the likelihood that the patient will have bad outcome. So later in the talk, I will give you some concrete examples showing how this works. And also, if the clinician is sued for medical negligence, then he needs to define uh, defend the clinical judgment in court. He needs to show the reason why he made a particular choice. And also for biomedical researchers, if we can automatically <coughs> discover the reasons or patterns, it will help you formulate new theories or hypotheses. So we already mentioned that most machine learning models, they are complex. They give you no explanation at all of the prediction results. And in reality, there are two conflicting goals. First, I want to achieve as high prediction accuracy as possible. At the same time, I want to understand the prediction results. So the model achieving the highest accuracy can be complex, such as support vector machine or random forest. It gives you no explanation. I can also build a single decision tree or a bunch of rules to give prediction. I understand the rules but the prediction accuracy will be low. So the challenge here is how to achieve the highest accuracy possible without and give you the explanations at the same time without degrading the accuracy. 
So now I'm going to show you the high-level approach to address those two challenges. So our approach is to develop a software system that can perform the following tasks in a pipeline efficiently and automatically. First, we want to automatically select good machine learning algorithm and good hyperparameter values to build predictive models for each predictive modeling problems we want to work on. And second, after generating the model, we also want to automatically explain the predictive results to healthcare researchers so that they can understand the reason, such as why a patient is going to have bad outcome. Then based on the reason, we can automatically suggest tailored interventions, what you can do to address this problem. And also, we want to generate outcome estimates for different configurations. By configuration, I mean a particular set of clinical attributes. So for different sets of clinical attributes, we can estimate, oh, if we use this set of clinical attributes, what kind of prediction accuracy we can achieve? What's the outcome we can achieve if we develop a model with this kind of accuracy? Then this will help guide the clinicians to develop a proper strategy to de uh, deploy a predictive model in a healthcare system. Because different healthcare systems, they collect different uh, clinical attributes. So our software is called a prediction tool using machine learning. And uh, we are in the process of developing it. It will be developed using Spark, which is a more advanced version of Hadoop, big data software. We will use MLLib, which is a machine learning package for Spark. We will also use new techniques to address existing software's limitations. And our software can run on a cluster of computers for faster parallel processing. And the goal here is that healthcare researchers, if they have access to our software, they can develop machine learning predictive models with big clinical data. And they can use the software to achieve similar prediction accuracy as the best models that are manually built by the computer scientists. And also because our software explains the prediction loss, they can understand the reasons. And our software will be developed on top of existing big data software systems. So many of you have heard of Hadoop. Hadoop is a big data software that implements Google's MapReduce framework for distributed computing. Distributed computing basically means you can do a lot of computational work in parallel on a cluster of computers simultaneously. Uh, Hadoop has a major shortcoming. It's not very good for interactive and iterative jobs. This is because in order to execute a job, Hadoop usually requires repeated reading and writing of data from and to disk. This incurs a lot of overhead. So this is basically disk IOs. And to address Hadoop's problems, uh, people have developed Spark. This is the hottest big data software these days. Uh, Spark's main idea is that we execute most operations in memory, and we try to avoid disk inputs and outputs whenever possible. And this has been shown to improve the performance by about 50 times. And MLlib is Spark's machine learning library, so you can do machine learning on a cluster of computers. So we will use these two in our software. So currently, the software is still under active uh, development. And we will take quite several years to get the whole system done. And after that, we will do a full evaluation of the software. So during this uh, long development and testing process, we will require collaboration with many healthcare researchers and computer scientists, including people here, for developing and testing the software. So now I'm going to move on to the high level technical approach of how our software works. First, about automatically and efficiently selecting machine learning algorithms and hyperparameter values. So this is the main obstacle faced by the current algorithms. Let's say we already know a machine learning algorithm, 
and we already know the value of each hyperparameter of this algorithm. We use this combination to build a machine learning model on the entire data set. This can take a long time. So for example, I recently tested um, a data set that has 10,000 patients. This is an open data set. This data set uses uh, 133 independent variables or attributes for, the patient, for a single patient. And uh, we use a public available uh, machine learning model that win uh, open competition for this data set. So this model has the best prediction accuracy, but it's fairly complex. It's ensembles of ensembles. So on this data set, knowing the best algorithm and the best hyperparameter values, we just train the model once. It takes two days on a computer with eight CPUs, 32 gigabytes of memory. I basically bought it using $3,000. It's a fairly uh, modern computer, but it still takes two days. It's just doing it once. And in reality, you have several dozens of machine learning algorithms, and you have over 100 hyperparameter values for those machine learning algorithms. So the entire search space is very huge, hundreds of dimensions. If doing the search once takes two days, and typically in order to do the search well, you need to do over 1,000 iterations. That's 2,000 days. That's very slow. So to address this problem, our idea is to do progressive sampling, filtering, and fine tuning to quickly narrow down the entire search space. So here are some technical details. Uh, if we use the entire data set to train the machine learning model, it's slow. So we don't want to use the entire data set. We start from small samples of the data set and keep expanding it. So in computer science, this is called progressive sampling. So we start from small training sample first. Then in machine learning, it's known that uh, if the training set keeps increasing, which means your sample keeps expanding, if you train a machine learning model using this data set, the model's accuracy will keep improving at the beginning more, more rapidly, later more slowly, until it becomes flat. OK, so this is the trend. Then you can use this trend. We do in, we start from a small sample. We do in expensive tests. So we are basically somewhere here. We do in expensive tests. We get a rough idea of how a combination works, a combination of machine learning algorithm and hyperparameter values. So we do those cheap tests. We can throw away unpromising machine learning algorithms. And also, we can identify unpromising combinations of hyperparameter values. So the idea is to identify the unpromising ones, throw them away as early and as much po as possible. Then later, we expand the sample size, make it bigger and bigger. And in this case, the search space already becomes smaller and smaller. And because the data set becomes bigger, we need to use more computational resources to do fine tuning of the promising combinations. So to reiterate, uh, we repeat the search process for multiple rounds. So over rounds, the data set becomes bigger and bigger, and the search space becomes smaller and smaller. And in the last round, we already narrowed down the entire search space, hopefully to a single combination of a good machine learning algorithm and a good hyperparameter values. Then, once we get things settled down, we can use the entire data set to train our model. That's our final model that will have high prediction accuracy, hopefully. So the, this algorithm is still being implemented, and here are some preliminary results. Um, we didn't uh, implement the algorithm yet on a computer cluster, but we did have a simple implementation on a single computer. And on a single computer, the state-of-the-art automatic search method is called the Autoweka search method. And we compare our method with the Automeca method on 21 famous machine learning benchmark data sets. 
so we show that on each of the 21 data sets, our search method is faster than the auto vector method by up to, t up to 10 times. And not only that, our method can also produce a model whose accuracy or error rate is up to 30% higher than the model built by the auto vector method. So that basically means we are faster, we also produce more accurate models. The reason we can build a more accurate model is because given the same amount of time, or even uh, we can do many more iterations of search. For example, auto vector may only search 50 times. Within the same amount of time, we can search 1,000 times. So we can produce more accurate models because we made more trials. Now let's move on to the topic of automatically explaining the prediction results and suggest tailored interventions. Okay, let's say our oh, oh method produce a good machine learning model. It has good accuracy. But the clinician will still say, uh, it's not good enough. Your model is too complex. Ensembles of ensembles, I don't understand it. So the challenge here is how can we maintain the same prediction accuracy at the same time, we can explain the prediction results to the clinician. So the traditional way you do this, you use a single model. Either it's high accuracy, or you use low accuracy, single decision tree. It's interpretable, but uh, the accuracy is too bad. So you use a single model, uh, you cannot achieve both purposes simultaneously. So the key idea is that uh, you separate prediction from explanation, you use two models. The first model is a traditional one. Whatever prediction model you can build with the highest accuracy, stick with it. Don't change it. It can be ensembles of ensembles, arbitrarily complex. That's fine. Then we build a second model. The second model is rule-based. Everybody understands rules. The second model is not used to make predictions. The second model is only used to explain the first model's prediction results. The rules in the second model are directly obtained from historical data. They are trained from historical data. And for each patient, the first model, which is the most accurate model, it generates a prediction result. And then we say, which several rules in the second model apply to this prediction results, and use those rules to explain the prediction results. And each rule give you a reason, and you can use those reasons to suggest tailored interventions. So I will give you some concrete examples. So there's an open data set that has 10,000 patients of electronic medical record data that cover all the 50 US states. And uh, the test case is to predict type 2 diabetes diagnosis within the next year. So you have three years of historical data of each patient. You want to predict who will have type 2 diabetes diagnosis next year. So we use a champion machine learning model that wins a competition for this data set. Uh, this machine learning model is the one I mentioned before. Uh, if you train it once, it takes you two days. Uh, it's slow, but it, the accuracy is pretty good. It's a prediction accuracy is about 90%. And our method can explain, our rule-based method can explain the prediction results for 87% of patients whose outcomes were correctly predicted by the champion model to be having type 2 diabetes diagnosis within the next year. So 87% is pretty high. It's good enough for clinical use purpose. And this automatic explanation problem has been an op open problem in machine learning for the last 30 years. It's regarded as one of the holy grace of machine learning. And we can show you how the explanation looks like. So I will give you three example rules so that you can get a feeling what's the explanation. So first, if a patient had a prescription of ACE inhibitors in the past three years, ACE inhibitor is a drug. It's mainly used for treating hypertension and congestive heart failure. 
And it's known that hypertension and congestive heart failure are known to correlate with type 2 diabetes. And if the patient's maximum body mass index record in the past few years is uh, at least 35, which means the patient is obese, and obesity is also known to correlate with type 2 diabetes, then our rules suggest that the patient is likely to have type 2 diabetes diagnosis within the next year. And in this case, the rules show some reasons. One of the reasons is that, oh, the patient is obese. Then we can also suggest a tailored intervention. Because the patient is obese, we should enroll the patient in a weight loss program to reduce the patient's weight. So this will reduce the patient's likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes later. As a second example, um, if a patient had at least six diagnoses of hyperlipidemia in the past three years, which means around two diagnoses per year, hyperlipidemia means a high fat level in the blood, and it's known to correlate with type 2 diabetes. And if the patient had a prescription of statins in the past few years, statin is a drug that's used to lower cholesterol, and how cholesterol is known to correlate with type 2 diabetes. And if the patient had at least nine prescriptions in the past few years, which essentially means uh, the patient used a lot of drugs, and uh, this means the patient is not healthy and it's correlated with type 2 diabetes, <coughs> then we say the patient is likely to develop type 2 diabetes uh, uh, next year. The third example, uh, if the patient... Yeah. Uh, the, so if a patient only satisfy those three conditions, uh, the likelihood that the patient has uh, this disease, uh, when you generate a rules, you have a threshold to control. And the probability is one of the thresholds you use. You, uh, what we have is uh, over 50%. It's, I don't remember the exact number. All the rules we generated, the, the probability is between 50 and 70%. Yeah. And all those rules cover at least 1% one, 1 of the patients. Because if it's too rare, like if only one patient has that pattern, mm -hmm. it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, the OK, so here is the third example. Uh, if a patient had at least five diagnoses of hypertension in the past three years, and if the patient had prescriptions of statins in the past three years, and in the past three years, the patient has seen doctors at least 11 times, that means frequent doctor visits. And frequent doctor visits, again, means the patient is not healthy, it's correlated with type 2 diabetes then we say the patient is likely to develop type 2 diabetes uh, within the next year. And in this particular case, one reason we found by the rule is that the patient has hypertension or high blood pressure. So we can suggest an intervention, say, oh, you should make lifestyle changes to help lower your blood pressure. This will help reduce your likelihood of developing type 2 diabetes in the future. So not all the rules. Uh, have corresponding tailored interventions, but we show that this is a fairly frequent case. And we show that for the majority of the patients that we can give reasonable explanations, we can also suggest the tailored interventions. So the, the percentage is close to 95%, something like that. I don't remember the exact number. So they are fairly reasonable uh, explanations and interventions, basically. So lastly, uh, just uh, giving the explanation still, yes? Before you continue, yeah. uh, I don't understand what, you know, uh, you have two models now. One is one model for the traditional model, the second model is uh, for interpretation or interpretation model. These two models are the same model or different models? Completely different. So the interpretation model is a neural network. Right. The second model is not a neural network. It's Just the rules. The second model is only a bunch of rules. How do you get it? I mean, do you derive the second model from the first model? No. The okay. The so the second model is derived from the data set itself. It has nothing to do with the first model. So you mean you build another prediction model, even not accurate? 
Right. Right. I can do it with that regression, right? right? Simple, right? You, then it's easier to, much, much more easier than the rule. I mean, if the rule is difficult to use the tool, I mean, the fact is, I don't think Docker believes this because you just say, okay, based on this rule, like, why? You tell, you, how do you explain this? Why? If you use a logistic regression, you can tell, oh, if I do this, the other ratio, you know, survival or whatever, increase or decrease. You can do that. But this is hard. And the question is, if I use a logistic regression for succession model for interpretation, how can you link this between logistic regression and the neural network? I mean, your, your, your high accurate prediction model is neural network. And then right. your second interpretation model is a logistic regression, which would be much easier. Uh, how do you, I, I don't understand well, how you, Okay. Um, so, um, if you have a logistic re regression, um, it's a single model. It's because the rule-based model has an advantage. You have many separate rules. So this is a one model. I mean, this when you do this uh, rule-based, it's just a one model, or you so, have about many, many of them. So, rule-based model is a model that contains a lot of rules. It, it may have 400 rules. They put them together is a single model. Right, this, this is what I understand. You are using either using CAR or any tree-based? Uh, no, the, the, the decision tree or whatever? No, the, the rule-based model is called uh, association rules. Yeah, or you know, whatever. It is. Right. I mean, even the association rule model is hard to integrate. I mean, I, I, you are using a, you know, another model, which is also difficult, a little bit better than you know, network, but it's still difficult to interpret. You, you are not to the, to the level to really explain to medical doctors to believe you know, what I mean. So that's my, my uh, so the individual rules is just a combination like and of different attributes. Right. So they can be understood, but it cannot give you say if uh, um, it's, it's not like logic regression as you said. If I, for example, if this um, attributes value is equal to three, if I increase it to four, what's the likelihood this patient's risk will? What's what, how how much risk? This patient's risk will increase. We we cannot give that. That's true. Right. My question is: This has nothing to do. It's independent from your prediction. I mean, your prediction model. Correct. How can you know this this is the same as the prediction? I mean, oh, okay. No, no. Result is a different thing. No, no, no. So, so if the first model, like the, the neural network model, right. it predict a patient will have type two diabetes diagnosis within the next year, then in the a uh, rule-based model, we have 400 rules, right? Some of the rules will say, oh, this patient will have type 2 diabetes. Some other rules say, not. You will not have type 2 diabetes. You pick up the rules that will say. Okay, so then if your interpretation model, the prediction accuracy only 10%, very bad. Okay. But if you use it for interpretation, even your, your prediction model is 90% accuracy. So you use a you use a very poor interpretation model to do that. You're right? basically just getting a rule right. that yeah. would explain that patient. We don't know if that is the rule. That we're may not be the right. I mean that's my yeah. This is may be wrong. Right. Maybe wrong. Yeah. So that's my you use yeah. the wrong rule. Yeah. And how can you you know convince the doctor to use it? Use that intervention. Uh, so yes. first, uh, this not to help the doctors make decisions, right? So this will. So for there are 400 rules. For a single patient, there may be only three rules apply to this patient. And those three rules will give different reasons. Let's say all those three rules apply to the same patient. So I give you three different reasons why the patient is likely to have type 2 diabetes diagnosis in the future. And the doctor can examine those rules and see, because those rules are only used to give the doctor hints. And also, we, we suggest some interventions, but we don't say this is a definitely correct intervention. We just give the doctor a hint to say this may be the right intervention. Because the doctor, OK, if you dump all the attributes, there are hundreds of attributes of the patient. You dump them, all of them to the doctor. The doctor will be overwhelmed. It's difficult for the doctor to think. But if we dump the information of only three rules, then the doctor can more easily think, oh, 
and they will pick, say, which rules make sense for this particular patient and which intervention makes sense for this particular patient. And by the way, all those rules, we were, they, they were checked by the clinician beforehand. So we generated those 400 rules beforehand. Each one of them is pre-checked by a diabetic doctor. Yes. The last two questions were kind of getting at the same issue, and uh, I know we've already spent a lot of time on this issue, but I'm going to ask it again because okay. I want to know the answer to it. Um, it. It seems like there's a fundamental trade-off between the accuracy of a, me uh, of a method and the ability to, to explain, because as the method gets more and more accurate, uh, you're, you're making more and more difficult decisions, right? Like the easy decisions that everybody gets is, is very, you know, very clear why the decisions make. Um, for, the, for the hard decisions, now you're looking at multiple variables that are combined in kind of uh, non-intuitive ways. So those, those kinds of decisions are hard to explain. Um, but uh, what you've done is separated out the uh, prediction part from the explanation part. And in fact, uh, what, what I would say is that you're not really doing explanation at all because you're not explaining why the, the method uh, made the decision that I made. What you're doing is you're rationalizing the decision after. Correct. Right? You made the decision which is okay because I think that's how people think, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. like I, don't, I have no idea why there's not a decision why I do that, but I can come up with a reason afterwards. Well, like my, my kids, I ask them, like, why didn't you get the toys today? And they say, well, you know, I had a lot of homework. And I said, well, for many days you don't have homework, but you still don't clean up your kids. So it's not a very good explanation. So, okay. But, <laughs> that's a pretty good explanation of the yeah. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, is there some quantitative way to measure how good the explanation is, and how good does the explanation have to be for the doctor's purpose? Uh, or the rationalization? So I would say that for each rule, you can control the accuracy because uh, you because each the rules when you mine those rules from the data set, you have threshold. You say. Among all the patients who satisfy those conditions, at least 50% of them will develop type 2 diabetes diagnosis within next year. Then only in that case, this rule is kept. Otherwise, this rule is never generated. So this will give you some hint to say how confident the rationale is. And uh, second, um, we verify the individual rules with the doctors. Uh, we can do another study, say, this is something we haven't done so far, is that uh, for each, in, we pick a bunch of patients, for each individual patient, we can use our method to generate the rules, give the rationales, right? Then we can display those rationales to the doctor, say, uh, do you think this will help you uh, uh, make your uh, treatment plan or help you with uh, your decision-making process? This is something we haven't done yet. And also, there are different ways of presenting those rules, which rule you want to present first, which rule you want to present second, or do you want to, for some rules, do you want to highlight certain attributes in those rules? So which highlighting method is best? This is something we are going to do for future work. We haven't done it yet. This is just basically showing that it's feasible to give you the rationales. But this is likely to be wrong. I mean, this have a very big chance to be wrong because it's a per prediction. Uh, this is like a feature analysis instead of a people really want different words. But anyway, we probably will have to work on okay. uh, ahead of time. Okay. Yeah, so the main idea here is that for each configuration, which may mean a combination of uh, clinical attributes, we want to estimate a prediction accuracy. Then we do simulation to estimate what's the outcome of deploying uh, such a model with this level of accuracy. Then for different combinations of clinical attributes, we can generate a different simulation results. And those simulation results can help people determine how to best generalize a particular pre model to different healthcare sites that collect different sets of attributes. 
So uh, in conclusion, uh, we, man, uh, we introduce a new software that's currently underdeveloped to automate machine learning uh, model building process on big clinical data. And this will open the use of big clinical data to many healthcare researchers. Uh, this will help uh, personalize our precision medicine for any disease, patient population, or healthcare system because the way we build the software is using general computer science principles. We are not relying on any special property of a disease or specific uh, patient population or healthcare system. And this will increase our ability to foster biomedical discovery and improve healthcare. And uh, then I will briefly mention my other work. So we have created an intelligent personal health record system and an intelligent medical search engine based on questionnaire. Those are for consumers who do not have much uh, medical knowledge. So the idea is that the consumers have little uh, medical background. They have difficulty forming the right medical queries. For example, they don't know the right medical term. So our idea is to use medical knowledge and a questionnaire to automatically form the medical queries for the user and use those medical queries to automatically retrieve the search results and put the search results together, present them to the user so that the user can um, see personalized healthcare information that help with uh, their daily activities of living. So here's an example. Let's say uh, before the um, patient goes to see the doctor, the patient uh, wants to see what kind of disease I may be having, uh, what kind of questions the doctor may ask me during the doctor visits, and what kind of uh, medical terms may be used by the doctor, etc. So the user wants to be prepared before he goes to see the doctor. So we are not trying to do medical diagnosis here, but we are trying to give you some information that may be useful for you. So we present a list of symptoms and signs. The user can uh, select symptoms such as cough. Then uh, we are essentially using an expert system to ask questions uh, related to these symptoms, such as do you cough or phlegm? So essentially all those answers to the question are pre-built by the system. The user just use a mouse to click which questions uh, answers corresponding to his or her case. Essentially we are navigating a medical diagnostic decision tree for the symptom or signs. And uh, we will reach the leaf node that contains a bunch of diseases that are the most likely ones corresponding to the user's inputs. Then for each disease, we can use it as a query to automatically generate search results for this disease. So I present all those diseases web pages to the user, put them into a hierarchy so the user can read those web pages and those web pages typically describe uh, what's uh, the details of this disease, what kind of questions the doctor will ask if you have this disease, what are the typical medical terms such as drugs that will be used uh, for this particular disease. So this will help the, uh, the patient be prepared. For example, he can think, oh, those are the details I should mention to the doctor because those are important. Uh, as another example, let's say, uh, um, a lot of uh, patients have chronic diseases and uh, medical products exist to help those patients to have a better living at home. So let's say if the patient has vascular dystrophy, our system can automatically generate the keywords for different types of medical products. So though each keyword will be used to retrieve a bunch of medical products and all those medical products will be combined together and present to the user. So if the patient has muscular dystrophy, we will find thousands of medical products that may be useful for the patient, such as a cane, walker, uh, gait belt. Those are all the medical products that can pr help prevent falls. So they are fairly diversified. Um, in comparison, if you just put a keyword muscular dystrophy into Amazon, you have only 13 results. They are all in the same category, nutritional supplements. They are not diversified. Also, the number of results is very few. So we have done uh, predictive modeling work for bronchitis and uh, pediatric asthma. So we built the first model for predicting a child's asthma control level for the following week. 
that means one week uh, ahead. We have done work on online sleep staging. So this is using EEG brain waves. And we build a model that uh, uh, improve the state of the art uh, prediction accuracy by about 8%. And we reach close to 90% accuracy. That's almost the theoretical limit that any machine learning model can ever achieve for this particular problem. Uh, we have done work on brain-computer interface for ALS patients, and we have done automatic relationship dis uh, discovery. So this is information retrieval. We have different entities, such as people's names, company names, etc. You can also use gene names, drug names. So given those two entities' names, we will use information retrieval to automatically discover what's the relationship or connections between those two entities. And this will be useful for Homeland Security, uh, bioinformatics, and health informatics purpose, depending on what type of entities you are using here. Uh, we have done stream processing work of big clinical data, in particular uh, online detection of new events continuously. And this has been used in IBM's uh, commercial big data software called Infosphere Streams. I invented uh, progress indicators for long-running SQL queries and program compilation that I can keep telling you how much time remains to finish this job of running a big SQL query uh, when this program compilation will finish. Uh, I'm a database PhD, so I have done work on real-time uh, materialized new maintenance and non-blocking query processing. And as Jomi mentioned before, as a part of the process, I filed about 25 patents. So that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. So um, I guess I'm sort of coming back to the decision support angle on this. Um, and by the way, very nice uh, presentation, uh, wide ranging work. Um, so. Um, to me, the, the rules that you presented, I, not, I don't need to pick on those particular examples, which I understand are just examples, are, are not plausible. They're uh, actually, they're very plausible. They're sort of obvious. In other words, for example, that uh, if somebody is, uh, uh, has hypertension and somebody has uh, obesity, that they're at risk for diabetes. Um, further, they seem to be uh, people that um, are already receiving a lot of medical attention. So can you comment on perhaps the trade-off, or whether there is a trade-off, between uh, telling, uh, uh, providing advice that's uh, based on a lot of data, which is generated by attention already paid to the issue that you're advising about, uh, as opposed to uh, not having enough data to provide advice? Oh, actually, uh, the reason those rules look like in that way is because we are limited by the data set. The data set is a public data set. It has limited attributes. And also, we don't want to invent a new predictive model. So we just reuse the existing best known predictive model. And this predictive model only uses certain features. We don't want to modify the features. We just demonstrate that it's feasible to generate those rationales or the rules. In reality, we will use a real uh, electronic medical record data set, such as the complete uh, electronic medical record data set from a healthcare system, such as Kaiser or Intermountain. And we will use as many clinical attributes as possible instead of the few that's used by their model. And also, when we generate those features, we will uh, try to try a more diversified set of features from the raw clinical attributes. For example, some features may be more clinically meaningful, but uh, they are not done by the model. Uh, by the way, the builder of this mo model, the champion model, is a computer scientist who is not an MD. So some of the attributes or features may not be the best ones that makes clinical sense. So if we try those things, and this is basically saying, um, you can view it as automatically generating rationales. You can also view it as automatically helping you to do discovery, depending on which problem you are working on. So if we, let's say you have an interesting uh, uh, clinical or genetic data set, and we can plug in this algorithm into your data set to see what kind of result we can generate. So for example, some of the 
each rule is essentially a pattern. You can say as a clinician uh, what the rule we show here are obvious, uh, but there may be some patterns that are not so obvious for a particular disease that the doctors may never thought about before, or let's say genetic data, the combination of different uh, genetic features, it's not so obvious. So and in that they, case, then, then they won't be possible. Pardon? And then they won't be possible. <laughs> yeah, so then we can ask. <laughs> I guess that's uh, what I'm getting at. Yeah, so then we can work with the domain expert to see oh, how meaningful is, or how clinically or genetically it's meaningful. And definitely, if you have a tool that can help you, even as a, first, it can definitely serve as a reminder. And second, if it can help you to do automatic disco discovery, if you have a huge data set, you have lots of features, tens of thousands of them, manually examining them is very difficult task. This one can definitely narrow down the search space greatly. I think what you're seeing is it's going to be hard for an intelligent computer system to explain something to a stupid human. <laughs> <laughs> Excluding the rare cases. So it seemed like you could have in that one where you said uh, try to do something about hypertension. You could have also done a search to see if any hypertension medicines had already been prescribed. Well, the patient's been seen 11 times. I know. So, you know, know three years. Okay. Well, then they have diagnosis <laughs> and they have prescription for statins and visits. And he said, you know, you should try to lower your blood pressure. Now you should look in the record and see if there's any evidence that you've already tried that. If you haven't tried that, that would be a great explanation, great idea. Right. Um, so, but I could also come up with that as a rule. Let's have a retreat of yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So, finally, we on the edge. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.